Um, that's all from me. Uh, we'll kick off with John. Ten minutes. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the government's economic strategy as advertised uh, is very simple. It, it is to squeeze the public sector, to get the deficit under control by reducing public spending, to promote a vigorous private sector-led economic recovery, to combine a tough fiscal stance uh, with a relatively loose monetary stance, keep interest rates down, reassure the markets, and we will have private sector growth. But if you read the numbers of the strategy, they're rather different. It's not as advertised. The strategy that you see in the two red books that the coalition have issued so far, uh, summer 2010 and spring of 2011, uh, they show um, quite big increases in cash public spending throughout the time period. Uh, they started off with a 5.3% increase in cash public spending and current spending in the first year, uh, they're moving on to a 3.8% cash increase in spending in the second year. That ought to be enough to give you a real increase in spending, allowing for the squeeze on wages and costs which they tell us they're doing. And the deficit comes down, uh, particularly in the later years of the five-year period, by the most enormous increase in tax revenue. Uh, they are forecasting $172 billion a year of extra tax revenue, uh, by year five of the strategy, 2014-15, compared with the last Labour year. Now, that, that strategy could work, but as you would immediately see, uh, we are assured that there are no more tax rate increases to come of any serious nature. It rests very, very heavily upon a rapid rate of economic growth. Uh, the government is forecasting well above trend growth for the last three years of the strategy, and it's already had to revise its growth forecast down twice uh, for the first two years of the strategy. Its uh, main downward revision for the early years was counterbalanced by increasing the growth rate for the later years. I fear that when they come to review it this autumn, uh, the Office of Budget Responsibility uh, will conclude that they need to downgrade the growth forecast throughout the time period. This will place the government with a difficult set of decisions to make. Uh, because that main source of deficit reduction, the big increase in revenue, will be damaged by the downward revision in the growth forecasts. And so the government has to decide whether to borrow more or whether to put stricter controls on spending or whether to find ways of increasing tax revenues other than economic growth. I want their, their strategy to work, and who doesn't? And I would like to see a faster rate of growth, which would undoubtedly help pay for this very big increase in public spending they are proposing. I personally would have hit public spending rather harder in the first year than they did. I think there are still areas of public spending they could squeeze out more quickly. But I'd like to spend my few minutes today concentrating on what they should do on their Red Book strategy to promote growth, to try and get that $172 billion a year of extra revenues the easy way by year five, uh, because there are more jobs, there's more business profit to tax, there's more activity. Now, I don't think the Bank of England is delivering loose money, just as I don't really think the government is delivering a tight fiscal policy. And if we look at the, the money growth situation, uh, it is definitely true that official interest rates are very low, and it is definitely true that the government is borrowing loads of money, but it is still very difficult for a private sector business or a private individual to borrow money for a project, and if they do borrow money, they don't borrow around an interest rate of half a percent, they borrow around an interest rate of 5%, 6%, 7%, a very different proposition from the low rates the government is still enjoying. Now, I have a, a possible solution to this problem, uh, which I have been recommending strongly uh, to the Chancellor and his colleagues, and that is this, that the government still owns a very large chunk of the British banking sector, uh, both directly by the bits it nationalized and through the very dominant shareholding it owns in RBS. I would suggest to them that they create three new clearing banks for the UK market out of the assets that they directly own and RBS owns, uh, that they construct packages of assets and liabilities that produce decent looking banks. They then float those off in the stock market to new private owners and at the same time get those banks to raise substantial sums in new capital so that those banks start off 
with good balance sheets without too many rubbishy loans on their books, and they start off with a lot of money, and then those three banks could get into the marketplace and compete and would make money available at sensible rates to decent projects and individuals and companies, and I think that would be a very welcome injection. I think we need something like a 50 billion injection. If the three new banks raise, say, 10 billion in the market, uh, they could lend five times that and stay well within the Basel rules and the regulator's requirements. That would be a 50 billion injection, say, over a two-year period. I think that's the kind of order of magnitude uh, the economy needs. At the same time, I think you do need to be very strict on the fiscal side. Uh, just to remind you that on the revised government plans from March 2011, this government is proposing to borrow an additional £485 billion pounds over the five years of this parliament. And £485 billion pounds is more than the total state debt was in 2003 before Brown and Blair went crazy with our money and borrowed too much. In other words, the British state got by with smaller borrowings than that for 2,000 years, and now the coalition government needs to add more than we borrowed in the first 2,000 years, just in five years. So I don't think we should be feeling we need to put on sackcloth and ashes for failing to offer a fiscal stimulus or failing to <coughs> borrow enough for wanting to do the public sector down. I think we, as Conservatives, should say that to a fault we are exceptionally generous with other people's money and that we are proposing on this coalition government plans to borrow 485 billion Assuming my fears are right, that the revenues are going to be rather lower than plan, uh, I suspect we're going to end up borrowing rather more than 485 billion. So the single most important thing to do to get the growth rate up is to get some private sector credit, and I think we could do that by forming new banks. Of course, I would go along with what I suspect other colleagues will be saying. I think the more you can do to lower tax rates on enterprise success, profit, and uh, activity, the better. I don't think 28% is the optimizing level for capital gains tax. Their own red book shows they're going to collect less revenue in the first full year of that than if they've kept the rate lower. I don't think 50% is an optimizing rate for the higher rate of tax. I think you tax the rich more if you went back to the 40%, which Blair and Brown thought was the right rate throughout their period actually in office. And of course, I would like to see us deregulate rather more. Deregulation is the tax cut that costs the Treasury no money. Uh, it's the way to take huge amounts of cost off business uh, without losing revenue. Indeed, it's better than that because you save the government money as well, because you save the money on making up the regulations and enforcing them and policing them and, and thinking about them. And there are plenty of regulations which I and others have proposed for the CHOP. I think we put 44 ideas in the Economic Policy Review, which we wrote in opposition, and I would hope the government would find a dozen of those at least uh, acceptable ideas. They thought they were quite good in opposition and I think that would help. So there are the three things to do, banks that work, uh, deregulate, get the tax rates to sensible levels, then we might have a private sector-led recovery, then we might be able to afford this enormous surge in public spending which the coalition is presiding over. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for that, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, John, uh, for that uh, contribution. Let me begin uh, on a note of, of, of consensus uh, on the issue of uh, the impacts of the fiscal consolidation uh, that this uh, the government has announced and the impact on the economy. Because we hear the charge made last week in Liverpool from uh, the Labour Party, from Ed Balls, is that there's been a slowdown in the economy and it is as a <coughs> consequence uh, of the uh, cuts in public spending. I think the first point we have to recognise is that uh, there has been a slowdown in economies across the world, uh, across the developed world. Uh, this includes the United States that embarked on a full fiscal stimulus last year uh, and yet uh, Growth in the UK in the first six months of uh, 2011 was in fact faster uh, than it was uh, in the US. The argument put forward that uh, there has been a slash and burn policy that has resulted in a decline in confidence and hit the UK's economy is quite frankly wrong. And, and John and I think we're entirely in agreement on that point. I don't entirely agree with him and his assessment of uh, the 
alleged disparity between the rhetoric uh, and the reality. Uh, and the first point I would make is that if we're looking at spending numbers, one really does have to look at real terms spending. Uh, and in real terms uh, spending, uh, we are seeing a reduction uh, for four continuous years, something that we have not uh, seen before. Uh, 37 of the last 44 years we've seen increases in real terms spending. Uh, there have been some isolated occasions where spending has not uh, increased, but they have been very much the exception to the rule. Uh, and we are seeing a sustained period of fiscal consolidation and, and, and spending reductions, uh, even though increases in debt interest will eat into government spending in a way that we have not seen before. Uh, and if I may give an illustration of the difficulty of using cash terms as opposed to real terms, I suspect there is nobody uh, in this room who would uh, advocate that uh, the uh, first Margaret Thatcher government from 1979 to 1983 was more profligate with public spending uh, than the Blair Brown government, and they'd be wrong to make such an argument. But in cash terms, public spending in that first Thatcher government went up every year more than in any year under the Blair Brown years. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, uh, there is a, an argument about actually how tight the Thatcher government was with public spending, and John and I have discussed it uh, many times. Uh, and to give, put uh, what we're doing on public spending in context, uh, in the average over the Thatcher years was that public spending increased by 1% in real terms every year, uh, just over 1%. Uh, in the major years, it was just below uh, 2%. Uh, and in the Blair Brown years, the average increase in public spending uh, was 4.4% in real terms. We are reducing public spending by an average of 1% a year over the course of the next four years. Uh, and just also to give a scale, uh, to put in context the scale of the increase in public spending uh, we saw in the Blair Brown years, I, I asked the Treasury for a officials a specific question. If public spending had been frozen, uh, in 1997-98 uh, increased merely in, in line with inflation, how much less would we be spending now? And the number they came back with was £254 billion. Uh, that is enough to wipe out the deficit and to raise the personal allowance for income tax not to £10,000, but to £100,000. <laughs> Uh, now, I say this not as uh, advocating that that's exactly what the previous Labour government would do, but it, 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 it gives a demonstration of the uh, uh, what we're used to, and one could almost say the, the addiction to public spending uh, that we have seen in this country. So uh, I would argue that the fiscal tightening and the focus on public spending rather than uh, tax increases uh, in real terms it is absolutely uh, the right thing uh, to do. It is also worth uh, pointing out that uh, uh, just today, in fact, during the course of the Chancellor's speech, uh, Standard & Poor's have reconfirmed uh, the UK's AAA rating. Uh, they have, uh, this is the credit rating agency that withdrew the, cripple, the AAA rating uh, from the US. And it demonstrates the importance of credibility, fiscal credibility, uh, which we have in the UK, the fact that we are borrowing on a par with Greece and Portugal and Italy and Spain, in fact borrowing more than many of those uh, countries, but we have a market rate uh, down at 2.5%, is demonstration of a credibility uh, that we have, because if we have a plan and because, as George has said today, we will uh, stick to that plan. But of course the, the debate today is about growth and, 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 and what do we do about it. Now there is no easy fiscal lever to pull, uh, and I think it is absolutely clear that the idea that we can uh, find additional money and increase the deficit in the short term in the hope that that will bring sufficient growth uh, that we will have further tax revenues that will pay for itself uh, is, is a, a, a hugely risky <coughs> argument and runs the risk of a, an increase in our interest rates that would suck far more out of the economy than would be achieved by a short term benefits on tax cuts. So I think the focus 
has to be on two things. One is the point that uh, uh, John has raised about credit easing. And as I go around the country, I do meet businesses who say, look, it is very difficult. We know, you know what the banks are saying about meeting their targets and so on. But it is difficult to get credit uh, at the moment. And the Chancellor uh, announced that we are looking at what we can do <coughs> with regard to credit easing, getting the Treasury involved, making it uh, uh, making it easier for uh, for medium-sized uh, businesses to issue bonds, uh, potentially looking at uh, small businesses being able to uh, package up their debt uh, in a way through the banks uh, that uh, could make uh, credit easier. The other side of it is the point that, again, John touched upon, which is the uh, supply-side reforms. Now, none of the supply-side reforms are things that will necessarily result in greater growth in Q4 of 2011. But we do know, again, the experience of the 1980s, that if you can, if you can uh, uh, deregulate your labour market <coughs> into a flexible labour market, then you are in a stronger position to create jobs. And we've announced today uh, not only the extension of the uh, time period before you can uh, take an employer to an industrial tribunal for unfair dismissal, dismissal from one year to two years, the very the very item that the CBI put on the top of their wish list. We've also said that uh, if you're going to take your employer to a tribunal, you have to put in a fee, uh, and uh, you will only get that fee back uh, if you win your case to try to discourage those vexatious uh, complaints. And, uh, and, and clearly, we have to be looking further what we can do uh, within this area. Within the tax system, uh, we have uh, embarked on uh, uh, bringing down our main rate of corporation tax from 28% to 23%, uh, one of the lowest rates in the developed world. We're reforming our control for our companies uh, regime, so we're not driving businesses away from the UK, but we are bringing them in. Uh, we have uh, uh, moved towards a system which is much more deliberative and consultative uh, in the tax system, uh, so that businesses know where they stand, that there is greater uh, certainty, I have to say, I have to contrast that with the proposal uh, being made uh, last week about predators and producers coming from the Labour Party. And for those of you who heard uh, uh, George Osborne earlier today, he was talking about the idea of uh, the Chancellor sitting there with the Guardian on the one hand and the FT on the other hand, weighing them in the balance. I, 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 I suspect it's a, much, it's a much bigger task than that. I think we we'll have to have a whole whole organisation in, in HMRC where businesses have to make presentations rather like Dragon's Den and they would be <laughs> sent out through one door if they've got a predator surcharge and another door if they haven't. It, 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 it's going completely uh, in the wrong direction. Uh, John raised the issue of CGT. I do, do disagree with him on, on, on his assessment of uh, CGT about where is the revenue maximising point, although I do uh, we may well come back to that in questions, or I do agree with him on the principle that we should set it at the revenue, uh, or no, no higher than the revenue maximising point, and he touched upon 50p, and we are uh, undertaking a review, or HMRC are undertaking a review uh, of uh, the 50p rate uh, to see how much revenue it really is raising. One of the arguments you hear is, well, even if it isn't, it is important as a matter of social solidarity. I would just ask the question about of those who are raising that particular point. Do we really want to be in a position to say to people, we are going to tax you a slab of your income, not because it's going to be used to fund public services, but because as a matter of policy, we simply don't want you to have the money. Uh, in, in put in, in, in those terms, I think there, there must be a, a, a question as to whether that is a entirely sound uh, and as I say, on the regulatory burdens, we are looking at what we can do, and some of it is controversial. Uh, planning reform has caused uh, clearly great disquiet uh, amongst a lot of people, but it is the right thing to do. Uh, and I think that's the, another point that has to be made about this whole agenda, is that there will be opposition in every attempt to deregulate. There will be an interest that will come up and say, no, not here. Uh, this affects us. Uh, it's too much of a risk. We don't want to do that. Actually, the government is pursuing some brave policies uh, in this area. So in conclusion, I just think I'm coming up to my 10 minutes, is that, yes, the government does have a plan for growth, not some 1970s corporatist plan for growth, but a desire to put in place the conditions for long-term growth to make the UK an attractive place to do business. And this does have to be focused in 
everything we do, whether it be in taxes, whether it be in regulation. Other <laughs> government departments have to be focused on this as well. And uh, George Osborne, as Chancellor, is absolutely determined to deliver on this uh, because it is only through reforming our supply side that we will ensure that the UK will grow in the years ahead. Uh, and uh, it isn't just about deficit reduction. A deficit reduction is necessary but not sufficient. Uh, but this government is de determined to deliver all growth. Thank you. Perfectly on budget time-wise, David, which yeah, bodes well. <laughs> uh, Senator Code of Jersey now. Uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to add a different perspective and will explain Jersey's efforts to grow our economy over recent decades and explain how Jersey <coughs> fits into the wider picture of British wealth creation and economic growth. For those who don't know Jersey, I will give a little background. Over 800 years ago, Jersey affirmed its allegiance to the Crown, and we have been loyal subjects ever since. From the early Middle Ages, Jersey fought off invasion from France on numerous occasions and suffered five years Nazi occupation during the Second World War. Even during the Civil War, when our sister island Guernsey joined the parliamentarian cause, we remained fiercely loyal, and indeed Charles II on two occasions was sheltered in our island. We have a long history as merchant traders, quickly adapting to changing economic and political circumstances. During the 17th century, Jersey was one of Europe's leading woolen goods producers. In the 18th century, we were shipbuilders and cod fishermen in Newfoundland. And in the 19th century, we developed our world-famous Jersey Royal New Potatoes and bred our renowned Jersey cow, <laughs> each creating, in their own way, enormous wealth for a small island. After the Second World War, our finance industry began to emerge, and in recent decades, we have emerged as one of the world's leading, well-regulated finance centers. This ability to adapt and reinvent ourselves has resulted in our current per capita GNI of around $67,000 per person, one of the highest in the world. Our finance industry presently represents over 40% of this, but we have not been immune from worldwide downturn. Our economy shrank by 5% this year. Our financial sector has fallen by 28% in three years, and banking profits have fallen from £1.5 billion to £800 million. However, on the good side, nearly three quarters of finance companies expect higher profitability and employment levels this year. Whilst the finance industry is dominant, it is in itself a very diverse series of specialisations, ranging from wealth management to funds and deposit taking. Funds, assets under management and deposits based in Jersey total over $1 trillion. Finance employs 13,000 people, being 25% of our total workforce. It is in the area of deposit taking that we make our best contribution to the wider British economy. Bank deposits are pulled by <coughs> banks in Jersey and upstream largely to the City of London. The last government commissioned Michael Foote to review our role, and he found that during the depths of the financial crisis, Jersey was upstreaming $220 billion in short-term liquidity to the City of London. Had these funds flowed elsewhere, it would have put significant strain on the quantitative easing program launched by the Bank of England at that time. Currently, our bank deposits exceed $260 billion, the majority of which originate from outside the EU. Just to put that into context, Jersey supplies the equivalent of one pound in every 20 pounds of retail bank deposits held in the United Kingdom. We thus consider ourselves to be a very significant and important conduit of funds and skills to the City of London. The value of Jersey companies listed on international exchanges exceeds $150 billion, and much of this value is traded through the City of London. Jersey attracts business from more than 200 countries. The reason we attract high quality business are many fold. We offer tax neutrality, we promote the highest standards of regulation and financial legislation, and have received many endorsements from measuring bodies such as the IMF, the World Bank, and FATF. We only admit the highest standard of financial institutions, and we only provide banking licenses to the world's top 500 banks. We offer very high standards of professional services, including accountancy, legal skills, and trust and wealth management services. As we are small, we can react quickly to changing market requirements and can deliver new legislation more easily. 
To deal with the economic contraction and to assist in diversification, this year we have embarked on a major jurisdictional expansion program. Together with other ministers, I have visited China, India, Israel and GCC, and we are already generating new opportunities for our economy. Our promotional PPP, Jersey Finance, in the last two years has opened offices in Hong Kong, Abu Dhabi and Mumbai. Our aim is to ensure that emerging market pool funds move to Jersey <coughs> so that they can be funneled to the City of London as opposed to being lost to other global centres. Our Parliament, the States of Jersey, ensures we have the most robust legislation to govern our financial services industry. And our Independent Financial Services Commission ensures implementation of regulations <coughs> in the most robust fashion. Our efforts have been acknowledged by the Global Finance Centre Index, which last week listed Jersey as the only offshore centre in its list of top 20 centres ranked by reputation. This adds to the endorsements we have received from the IMF, OECD and others. We were one of the first jurisdictions to be placed on the OECD whitelist and have signed tax information exchange agreements with over 20 countries. On the domestic front, we pride ourselves in our prudent fiscal management. We run a large, largely balanced annual budget comprising around £600 million tax and duty raised and £600 million public expenditure. Through prudent management, we have liquid reserves of £800 million and no public debt. From a current account perspective, we have responded to the economic <coughs> downturn by cutting public expenditure by £65 million annually or 10% and raising consumption tax from 5% to from 25% from 3%, and we have also embarked on a fiscal stimulus program. The foundation stone of any finance centre is a secure taxation system. We are committed to maintaining our personal income tax rate at no more than 20%. This has remained unchanged since the, sec since the Second World War. There was some uncertainty over our 010 corporate tax regime, but very recently this has been accepted by the European Code Group. In this respect, I must sincerely thank the Exchequer Secretary David Corbett for his efforts in this area. We are concentrating on expansion into new emerging markets, both from a financial services perspective and from a new in industries perspective. From my visits overseas, I have no doubt that there are tremendous opportunities in IT, clean tech and science enterprises and environmental technologies. As a small jurisdiction, it is clearly apparent that greater fro profitability is delivered through the creation of environmental exemplars. Before my current appointment, as you will have heard, I was Jersey's Planning and Environment Minister for six years. During that time, we introduced many business environmental initiatives, from a government business accreditation scheme to specifying the highest environmental standards for our new office buildings. Extraordinarily, in each case, investment in environmental commitment has delivered significantly increased profitability and market share <coughs> to the enterprises involved. As an added bonus, the measures generated a greater sense of well-being and commitment, both for principals and staff. I am convinced that as a small jurisdiction, a significant part of our wealth creation potential lies in furthering our environmental credentials and using this to attract <coughs> new business. It may well be as important as the high standard of our legislative and regulatory credentials. As a small jurisdiction with limited infrastructure, we have to focus on delivering new business <coughs> without significantly increasing our population. To facilitate this endeavour, we will be investing in a super-fast 1 gigabit broadband infrastructure connecting every home and business in the island within two years. We are firmly of the view that this is essential as a catalyst for new business and will make us one of the first gigabit economies. Many are of the view that if the City of London is to counter the ambitions of Hong Kong and Singapore to usurp the City of London's position, that the city will need a combined onshore, offshore tax neutral offering. In this area, Jersey and of course Guernsey have a significant part to play. I mentioned at the outset that the Foot Review identified Jersey's contribution in delivering $220 billion of liquidity to the city. We are about to embark on a further study to quantify other areas in which we contribute to the British economy and importantly to identify areas of international business where we can work together to our mutual advantage. We are very appreciative of the new dawn represented by the coalition government and the warm reception we have received from ministers and MPs. Jersey's government is concentrating on developing business that is of benefit to both our economies. Jersey has been a loyal partner to Britain for over 800 years. We have always adapted to changing circumstances over the centuries. 
As the world economies change, new opportunities arise, and I have no doubt that many of these can be leveraged to our mutual advantage in our joint endeavours to create wealth to better our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think the UK economy is at a turning point right now. And it's quite interesting, it was at a previous turning point a couple of years ago. The first turning point was, <clears throat> shall we go bankrupt, or shall we not, uh, as a country? So that was obviously quite a dramatic and urgent uh, decision that needed to be taken. And it was a question of, you know, you had a massive, spiraling, complete out-of-control budget deficit, an exploding national debt, uh, and an economy that was literally uh, heading for the rocks, in a way slightly similar to, to what we've seen in some other parts of Europe and, uh, and the world. And I think, by and large, um, the coalition took the right decisions uh, when it came to the aggregate, when it came to fiscal policy and bringing the budget deficits back under control again. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that the plan will actually uh, deliver the reduction in budget deficit that the Chancellor hopes for, largely because I think it's too predicated on growth, uh, which is not going to materialise uh, in the amount that uh, is hoped for, and insufficiently on reducing public spending. But nevertheless, I think um, George Osborne managed to convince the financial markets. The financial markets are obviously are very, very important because they're lending the government all the money. And this year, for example, they're going to lend the government an extra 130 billion or so, uh, all of which will be obviously added to the national debt. So by and large, I think um, the, the aggregate fiscal policy has, has been right. Um, the UK is back slowly but surely, more or less at least, uh, towards a path of fiscal sustainability, at least for the short term, at least for the next uh, few years. Um, the problem, of course, with all of this is it could all be derailed by a major recession in the Eurozone. Um, you know, as, as we speak, there's more talks going on. There's a the Belgian bank called Dexia that's in a, a spot of bother. Um, <laughs> there's all sorts of other problems, in, obviously, in Greece. And yesterday, Greece admitted that their budget deficit is going to be even bigger than previously thought. The Eurozone crisis is massive. It's a major event. It ought to be overshadowing this conference to degree, to a much greater degree than it is at the moment. Um, I'm afraid I don't think I don't think enough people in this country and in, in, in politics, both in government and in opposition, have fully grasped what is going on there. This is a, a, a very big moment. So it's possible that the UK could be derailed by these external forces. And if the UK were to face another recession, say in a few quarters' time, there'd simply be no chance of the Chancellor's. Uh, fiscal projections ever being met. So that's that's a major issue still. So so this whole bankruptcy question, for the moment we've avoided it, and I hope we continue down that road, but there's still a number of risks ahead. So that was the first choice. Um, the second choice, I'm afraid I don't think has been, you know, there's no decisions being taken on, on the second choice. And the second choice is, what kind of economy and what kind of society does Britain want to be? Does it want to be a dynamic, high-growth, entrepreneurial, <coughs> Um, upwardly mobile, very, very dynamic country uh, of the kind that a lot of people hoped would, would happen in the 1980s. D does the UK want to try and be a Hong Kong or Singapore or, you know, of, of Europe? Does it want to be that sort of exciting place? Or does it want to be a decently managed social democratic country on the edge of the European Union with slow growth? a sort of, you know, not particularly exciting prospects, but, you know, high levels of, of wealth, but nonetheless gradually declining in terms of global league tables. That is the real question. And I'm afraid, it, you know, th there's two ways to look at it. I mean, I think the government has put through some good supply-side reforms, um, a few, but unfortunately I feel they've been swamped by negative, uh, by a tidal wave of regulation, especially from the European Union, but also domestic regulation. I think it's, it's a fair point to say that, and obviously others of this table will disagree with me, I'm sure, but all the business people I speak to feel that it's harder, more costly, more onerous and more regulated to hire somebody now in the UK today than it was 18 months ago. On balance, there's been an increase in labour market regulation. There's been, I think, seven major pieces of legislation on just about everything from agency workers to, to the retirement age change to return to paternity leave, to all sorts of issues. And there's been one positive change uh, which has been again re-announced today about, uh, about um, the, the time at which people can take uh, employers to court for unfair dismissal and so on, but that's not even going to actually change until April, I think. 
So there's been actually far more this of regulation than have been removed. There's also obviously been a lot of anti-growth taxes, including employee, uh, national insurance, higher capital gains tax, and so on and so forth. So I don't, I don't recognise this picture of a supply-side revolution. What I see is still far too many new rules coming all the time, a massive expansion of European Union's regulatory powers in new areas, huge transfer of powers to, to the EU when it comes to financial regulation, for example. Um, all the financial sector, which is very, very important to the UK, is now being regulated out of um, the EU. The FSA itself acknowledges it. Uh, you know, they, they obviously don't deny this. Um, they've become a secondary kind of regulator compared to the European Union uh, institutions. These are major, major events, major, major transfers of power. And every single time, they're accompanied with a huge onslaught of regulation. For example, the latest is uh, the EU is proposing a massive regulatory revolution when it comes to accountancy firms, for example, which the UK is quite good at compared to the rest of the world, but could, if the current proposals are implemented, uh, entirely revolutionise the way it's done. The EU wants to impose a Tobin tax on the UK, uh, again, that may not happen, the UK may be able to stop this and so on, but you, you see the picture, and it's happening all the time, all the time, all the time. So we're not deregulating our economy, there is no supply-side revolution going on, and I'm afraid with those kinds of things going on, there's just not going to be a lot of growth. There's going to be some growth, and the situation is not a disaster, by the way, even though the economy is now grinding to halt again. There was a burst of activity um, a few quarters ago. I think a net, the private sector has created a net 700,000 jobs since the end of the recession. That's been compared to about 350,000 or 300,000 job cuts in the public sector. There's been an increase in employment, and there's been some, quite a lot of good things. But on balance, unfortunately, the economy is grinding to halt again, uh, partly because of domestic problems, partly because of global factors, and there just isn't a, a regulatory revolution in the cards. There isn't this tearing up of red tape, this massive reductions of the cost of doing business. There's none of that. And we, you know, until some, some sort of radical policies are taken when it comes to increasing the incentives to work, save and invest, by reforming the tax system and by getting rid of a lot of regulation. There's just, I just can't see how one can go back to the kinds of rates of growth that a lot of people expect as normal. So I'm afraid to say the only, what it looks like being the outcome is, hopefully we won't, be, get, we won't fall into recession, but unfortunately we don't control that because that's to do with what happens in the Eurozone. And after that, just years of sluggish growth um, and, and, and no, no big boom time, no return to strong growth. And I would just hope that the coalition rethinks um, its attitude towards regulation and, and, and these high marginal tax rates and tries and does something a bit more radical than we've seen so far. It's always good to end on a happy note. Uh, we have about 25 minutes, I think, for questions. Um, hands going up already. Uh, if I can just ask you to keep the question short, uh, but I'll go right to the back to start okay. with. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Isabella Moore. I'm a businesswoman and past president of the British Chambers of Commerce. And my question is on growth potential. 15% of the businesses in the UK are female women. <coughs> that represents 700,000 businesses. Um, yet it's twice as likely for a woman to set up in business in the United States than it is in the UK. And my question is, what does the panel think can be done to encourage more women into enterprise as a potential for contributing to the growth of the UK economy and to help uh, existing female-owned businesses to grow? David, do you want to start on that one? Well, I, I'm, I, I'm struck that the person asking the question is much better qualified to answer it <laughs> than I suspect an any of us up here. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, um, I mean, I think the principal purpose of for government has got to be in putting in place the conditions that is good for everybody to uh, start up businesses, um, uh, regardless of gender. So in a way, I do put the question uh, back to you, because why do you think there are fewer women starting up businesses in the UK as compared to the U US proportionately? Uh, and and, and uh, what can we do? Because I, 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 I suspect you know the answer better than I do. Um, well, I think there are two reasons. One is that women face different pressures to men, and there needs to be greater acknowledgement of those pressures by men, by, by uh, men, and also that women bring a different um, perspective, a different way of running a business. And you know, the fact that there are, there is 15% only of female-owned business, I mean, that's proof enough. 
So I think a greater acknowledgement of the different pressures and the different needs of women in business, I think, would be a good starting point. Got something to think about. Uh, the next question, please. Yep, uh, just up at the back there. No, nope. yep. Uh, Josh Spiro from Spears Magazine. Um, Mr. Redwood, your um, account of the outreach to South Freedom Bank sounds like a very good idea, but it sounds far too radical for the government to do. Do you think, or how does the panel think, that we can encourage banks to lend more money when they're being pressed to keep uh, more capital reserves at the same time? Well, you've answered your own question, and it, it isn't working at the moment because the regulators are stopping it working, maybe for good reasons. Uh, all the time the regulators are urging higher degrees of regulatory capital, um, the way the banks will implement that is by lending less. And if you set up Merlin targets, the banks in some cases will hit the Merlin targets, but they'll cut back on other kinds of lending, uh, and you will not achieve the desired result. So you have to do one of three things. You either have to say, for a period, we will relax the regulations a bit, um, that would be quite heroic at the moment, given the firestorm surrounding sovereign bonds and other banking assets. Um, the second thing you could do is to say that the existing banks have to raise more capital. And that would apply primarily to the state-owned ones, and so it just lumbers the state with the need to take on more debt, which is not uh, the normal way of getting a deficit done. Or you do the third way, which is to get the, um, the banks you control to raise more private capital. And I would suggest doing that by splitting them up, because I do not myself find it at all acceptable that the senior management of RBS are still paid the most enormous salaries and bonuses under the contracts that Labour offered them uh, for losing us money as taxpayers and showing no sense of urgency in sorting out this zombie bank and making it contribute to the UK economy. Uh, this is a bank which still has a balance sheet of £1.4 trillion pounds which is the same almost as the annual national output of the whole economy. So it shows how mad Labour was to assume all this risk on our joint behalves. And the sooner we split it up, break it down, and get rid of some of the risks, the sooner we're going to get this country moving. You may think it's radical. I'm saying to the government, if you don't do something like this, RBS is not going to work, and the UK economy is not going to work. The choice is the government's. Um, just, I'm just going to make a slightly uh, different point. I think, um, to me, I think credit is less the issue in the UK economy than, than John thinks. I think, it's, I think we need to almost change our mindset, and I think it's, we're facing real problems rather than sort of credit problems uh, in the UK economy right now, hence why I think I'm, I'm more interested in the sort of tax and regulatory uh, solutions and so on. But I'll just make one other point on the just previous question about small businesses, if I may, and it is, I think the UK is quite good in the aggregate at producing the conditions for a lot of people to start a small business, but the environment is very bad for these small businesses to turn into giant global multinationals like Facebook or Google. That's the UK's big challenge. There's a small percentage of, of companies only that ever turn into giant companies or have the potential to do so. People call them gazelles. And I think there's, there may be 7% of, ne nearly all the jobs created by small businesses are created by 7% <coughs> of small businesses. And the problem in the UK is they just don't, it's very hard to go from the small one you've just set up to this bigger one. And it's even harder, virtually impossible, to turn it into a giant global company that changes the world. And America's very good at doing that, and we're very bad at doing that. So those are the, that's where the, the policy focus has to go, making it easier. Uh, fewer burdens and so on on, on on people to do that, and also a better financial infrastructure, maybe some, some way to encourage venture capital and, and sources of capital like you see in the US, and finally a breaking down of the barriers between universities and financing sources and business. Thank you, John. Well, uh, just uh, very quick, I, mean, I, agree, I agree with a, a, a lot of that, and the history in recent years, and I look at what the last government did in encouraging small businesses and the hope of finding uh, the Gazette, so actually there have been some fairly ill-targeted, uh, ill-thought-out proposals like the 0% corporation tax, which, which didn't work, didn't fulfil the objectives that it was, it, it was, it was trying to do. Um, and where we need to be careful is make sure that we've got the, the, the right policy response. And I think the regulatory burdens point is, that Pastor raises, is absolutely 
uh, the right one uh, in, in that area. The UK, we're not bad at starting up businesses, but getting them getting them bigger, getting those uh, new emerging uh, businesses, we are weak. Well, I'm afraid I, I can only answer from the perspective of Jersey, um, and we're a very small, uh, comparatively microclimate. Uh, there's very little we can do in relation to instructing banks to lend more money, but we have the, exactly the same problems as uh, you have uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, we can only hope that uh, it will relax over the period of time, but actually in terms of small business, and we have a, a strong policy of promoting uh, new small businesses in Jersey, uh, the most effective tool we can use is reducing regulation and red tape. And if anyone sees the um, quantity of forms that are necessary to start a small business, even in a place like Jersey, you've got to be extraordinarily committed to actually even be able to plow your way through. So my view is that uh, getting uh, our economy uh, more diversified is largely around making life easier for businesses and uh, deregulation. Uh, also with a little bit of uh, Philip, which you can uh, add by an incubator fund, and I've been a strong promoter of uh, having a state-funded business incubation fund. Cluster of hands here, the lady in the corner there. Uh, Joe Valentine, Chief Executive of London First. Um, I just wanted, I think, more or less to agree with, with Alistair's analysis. Firstly, the, the backdrop of the Eurozone for the, for the next few years is going to be extremely uncertain. But um, this difference between a high growth economy or one that's drifting slowly backwards, London is possibly the most successful service sector economy in the world. And if you were trying to think how to hobble London's economy, you'd introduce immigration caps, you'd say you can't have any more aviation capacity expansion in the southeast, and you'd have a top rate of tax of 50%. Um, now, uh, can I just urge the government on the point of the 50% tax, where we are out of line with all our international competitors, the medium term damage done by that top rate of tax, I think, is, is huge, um, and the drift will be down in the tax take over the medium term, in my opinion. Maybe we'll see what the analysis comes out. So the sooner you can get that down, the better. The, the, the good signals those will send out, send out worldwide as well will be very helpful. I just wanted to ask the panel a question on infrastructure, which no one's much mentioned. If we have got this uncertain backdrop for a very much longer period, um, are we going to step up our investment in infrastructure over the medium term, not the short term? And are you going to do something about post-PFI to leverage private sector <coughs> students to get the money in? I, I think infrastructure is crucial. I think it's got to be privately financed. Uh, you can't do it without my three new banks. One of the points, <laughs> one of the points of having the three new banks with with 10 to 15 billion of extra capital is that then exactly those sort of projects would be financeable. Uh, part of my 50 billion private sector stimulus would be solidly financed infrastructure investments. I want toll roads. I want expanded airports. Um, we obviously need a lot more electricity generating capacity, we need more gas capacity, we need to get over some of the um, extreme uh, carbon dioxide reducing measures which will hit British industry but won't, won't reduce the amount of CO2 around the planet. Uh, we need more broadband investment. There are a whole series of very financeable things that people regard as utilities, relatively low risk, that can have high, high leverage without being insecure. And that is why you need a working banking system, not a broken, broken banking system. The FSA is still squeezing the existing banks. The government clearly isn't going to put in more capital to the bank it owns, so it desperately needs to get some money from somewhere for a big private sector-led infrastructure spend. Just a quick point from Alistair, and then we'll come to you, David. Um, I, I agree about the point about private, privately uh, created infrastructure. We've got a massive problem with infrastructure in the UK, but the solution can't be for the government to, 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 to pay for it. The government just doesn't have any money. There's ma massive problems in infrastructure in the UK, the, and we always forget that the, that the road network is actually where the most transport takes place. For example, London needs more bridges, the rest of the UK needs more roads. So, but, um, but I think it has to be crucially privately financed. And on, on just one point that John made, uh, uh, that's another very important uh, point that's going really badly wrong in this country. We, we are risking to price ourselves out of manufacturing by our extreme carbon dioxide reduction measures. I mean, I'm just very nervous about the future of UK manufacturing when I see the sorts of costs that are being put onto it. Yeah. On, um, first of all, let me agree with, 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 with John and Alistair about the point on infrastructure. And if you look at 
some of the research that have been done uh, with regard to productivity, the, the fact that uh, France, although they don't have, they have a, a, a much less flexible labour market, nonetheless have higher productivity numbers, is largely because their infrastructure is superior uh, to ours. Uh, there is a challenge there. If you look at the priorities on um, public spending, uh, although we, uh, we reduced uh, current spending compared to the plans we inherited, we didn't do the same with capital spending, but it is nonetheless the case that it's going to have to be uh, private finance that uh, sets up to the plate, and I, 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 I note again John's uh, proposal uh, about the extra banks and the contribution that that could, that could pay. I've made my point on, on, on 50p earlier, but also just to draw the meeting's attention to what the Chancellor said on carbon uh, emission targets and the fact that, uh, as he said earlier today, um, it doesn't make sense to drive business uh, outside the UK uh, that doesn't result in a uh, reduction in worldwide uh, carbon emissions. And although we will implement our targets, we will do so uh, certainly no slower, but no faster than other European countries uh, in meeting that. And I think that is a sensible and pragmatic approach. Very quickly, Freddie. Uh, yes, I mean, I can again any answer from a, a Jersey perspective, but we have a 25-year, uh, £1.5 billion pound program for infrastructure investment, uh, the largest of which is a new hospital <coughs> around £300 million. Pounds. And uh, our view is that this should be largely privately financed through a new model of PPP, which uh, we're developing, that will uh, largely capitalise on the local private investment market. So that's really the way we're planning on having Watch that space just there, yes. Uh, thanks. Uh, Colin Corman, Islington and Conservatives. Um, I want to introduce my own opinion at all. What's the, panel, what's the panel's view on a second round of quantitative easing for the Bank of England? Should we just go along the row on that one? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it should only happen if the Eurozone crisis escalates out of control and the global banking system grinds to haunt. If that's not what, if that doesn't happen, I don't think it should go ahead for the time being at least. Uh, second round of quantitative easing, like the first round, would be a disaster. I strongly advise against it. It might lower the exchange rate further and put up prices more. Uh, one of the reasons we have a private sector squeeze is we have too high an inflation rate in this country already. And the last thing we want is, is another round to increase the inflation rate. The kind of monetary easing you need is private sector-led credit for worthwhile projects, and that requires three new banks, <laughs> not, not a load of quantitative easing. <laughs> Again, it's, it's not appropriate for me to comment on uh, what the UK government should or shouldn't do. All I can say is, from a Jersey perspective, I think we're looking at uh, a second round of fiscal stimulus at some time in the future. Uh, and I think uh, all, all, all I would say on, on, on this question is that uh, quantitative easing is essentially a question for the Bank of England in it, forming its role uh, as uh, setting monetary policy, and I don't think it would be helpful uh, for uh, government treasury ministers to provide a running commentary on what they should do. Let's have the kind of shirt there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, sir. I'm Tim Passmore. I'm um, leader of Mid Suffolk District Council. The one point I wanted to make and get the panel's view on is um, most local authorities have had their expenditure for the district level cut by a quarter over two years. Now that's fine. We've managed that without a lot of fuss, without a lot of wholesale close downs and stripping things out. It's been difficult, but nevertheless, we will deliver. Are we really sure the government has actually done this to other departments <coughs> throughout the, the, the whole of the uh, public sector economy? I'm extremely concerned about the levels of debt that are still going to increase. We have got to get the private sector going. Have John's three banks, have six banks, but let's do something. But is there really this driving government, or is this another compromise we've got because we're in a coalition? I'm really concerned about that. I know the point of, of the experience of, of, of local government. And I think we'll have disagreement on this panel about it. But as I was saying earlier, the uh, reduction in real terms in public spending, <coughs> in departmental spending, uh, is much more significant than we have uh, experienced in modern times. Uh, it is a, 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 a significant tiny. It is not a slash and burn approach, as our opponents would characterise it. And I, I think John has made a number of very sensible arguments about putting it in, 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 in context, but nonetheless it is a significant squeeze in, in public spending. Most of the deficit reduction 
uh, will be achieved in real terms through the reduction uh, in public spending. Uh, and we believe we have got the, the balance right. Uh, and uh, as I say, compared to what was done in previous Conservative governments, we are going much, much further in controlling public spending. I think you're right that more needs to be done in some central departments. It's been very asymmetric. There have been big paid for cuts in defence. Some of the other departments have not seen anything like that. Uh, I think we should stop practically all recruitment other than of frontline people like nurses and doctors. They are still replacing civil servants that, that leave. I think that's quite wrong. Uh, we're meant to be entering a two-year pay freeze, but we're going to see upward drift in pay. I think it should be a comprehensive pay freeze, and I think they need to revisit what they're actually doing. It would be better to keep more people in work at a sensible level of remuneration rather than pricing them out and having to have even bigger cuts. I think we should defer the increases in overseas aid. I think we should tell our European partners that we want a looser arrangement with them and we don't want to be paying as many European bills as we are currently paying. I could go on, I could give you a nice long list. There are plenty of ways of squeezing billions out of the growing public spending we currently see. And, uh, John, uh Out now, but, uh, I have to go now and, and launch a book at another fringe meeting. I hope you'll forgive me. <laughs> You've been a lovely audience, and now, <laughs> now they can say all sorts of nasty things about me behind my back. <laughs> I know there's a lot of quick. Can I have a quick show of hands? Who's got a question that they want to ask in the 10 minutes we've got remaining? And I'll judge how to take them. Okay, only, goodness me. Three. Okay, we'll go to you first. I've been waiting a while. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Michael Bull, is linked to Conservatives. Um, a lot of the speakers have spoken about the need for deregulation, but I just worry that um, the focus on deregulation could lead to um, the culture returning um, that got us into this crisis in the first place. Uh, and I think that there are some areas where uh, regulation is necessary. Okay. Um, most crucially in terms of the separation between retail and investment banking. Alistair, oh, that sounds like your kind of topic. I wasn't even talking I wasn't even talking about financial regulation, by the way, in what I was saying. Uh, I was talking about other kinds of regulation, labour market regulation and, yeah. and all sorts of things like that. But by the way, on financial regulation, there's thousands, if not tens of thousands, of pages of financial regulation before the financial crisis. Of course there's the wrong regulation. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and there are also lots of other reasons why there was a financial crisis, um, including to do with loose monetary policy and so on. So that's, that's, a, that's a different debate and different conversation. But I think, um, I think we are an absurdly overregulated country in the UK. And I think either we do something about it, and then we've got a chance of returning to growth and, and sort of become a truly exciting place for global business and, and economic growth, or we don't. And then we drift sideways, a little bit of growth, a little bit of progress. Um, not too bad, more gradual increase in jobs, not too many. And we fall massively behind the booming emerging economies over the next two decades or three decades. And, uh, and, and you know, we allow the, the, the center of gravity to really, really move east uh, when it comes to, to, to most things. So I think that's really one of the choices we face. Yeah, it's, it's one of the ironies uh, of uh, recent years, so the, the one, the, the, the specific area where things went very badly wrong happened to be the most regulated part of the economy. Uh, and I agree with Alistair partly about wrong regulation. Partly it wasn't so much a failure of regulation, it was also a failure of supervision. Uh, and we, we, we <coughs> forget that. But banks are different. Banks do need to be regulated. Uh, it is the case that the taxpayer has to step in uh, when banks fail in some form or other. Uh, so it's important that that is properly regulated, but there is scope outside that sector for <laughs> the deregulation, which I would argue uh, the government is embarking on. Uh, so I'd like to ask you a quick question of my own, because I, in your remarks, I think you said 10% um, a year spending cuts. Was that right? Yes, we, we, we cut our uh, annual expenditure by 10%. Yeah. Oh, and uh, can we Introduce you to George Osborne, perhaps? <laughs> 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 the, chap, the chap who did it is uh, Senator Enzo, who's sitting in the front row. Oh, and yeah. uh, the, the way we did it was by um, uh, Philip, as Treasury Minister, being extraordinarily robust with every minister and uh, telling us that we had absolutely no alternative. And actually, when I, when I started, um, I was uh, Minister for Planning and Environment. 
and I was told by my officers that it was absolutely impossible to deliver 10%. By the time I left, we'd identified cuts of 10% that we had implemented and another 5%. So my view is of uh, public structures is there are always efficiencies in them. You've just got to struggle to find them and keep bashing away. And I often describe them as the public service, in Jersey particularly, uh, as good people in a broken system. And actually the system can be improved and you can better use the really good people you have within it. But they're always efficiencies. Yeah. And there are two remaining questions, I think. Uh, front row and then we'll go towards the back. Uh, Mark Berger, I'm chairman of the Jersey Competition Regulatory Authority, but also a member of the government's Regulatory Policy Committee. Now I'd like to follow up on regulation generally, where the government has a very clear ambition and a programme, but I don't think business is seeing many of the effects of it yet. And one of the issues here is that actually regulators are exempt from it, because it's difficult to have independent regulators and to apply regulatory policy to them. I'd like to ask John Redwood about that. <laughs> <laughs> but as he's not Three here, new perhaps, banks. Others, <laughs> perhaps others would like to comment on actually how the government's ambitions on regulation, not in financial services particularly, can work across the board. David, it's pretty tough to get rid of regulation, seems to be the experience. It is always promised and rarely delivered. Well, uh, we have uh, identified re regulations that we've scrapped that I think say uh, business is something like £350 million a year, but it's, it's an endless task. And uh, uh, there is undoubtedly a challenge coming from uh, the European Union, which is a source of uh, regulations uh, and, a, and a fast and steady stream of them. Uh, so we do have to uh, battle with those. We have got the one out, one out, one in, one out um, process. We have got the red tape uh, challenge at the moment where whole areas of regulation are put under review and consultation with the onus on those wanting to maintain those regulations uh, being to, to, to win their arguments. Um, but the gov government has to be constantly vigilant because the pressures that are placed to increase regulation, to interfere here, there and wherever, <coughs> are very strong. And we do have to be, as I say, determined uh, to reduce that burden because you know, actually I agree with Alistair's ambition about us wanting to be a dynamic economy. Uh, and that does mean that we have to be flexible, we have to be open and we cannot overburden our wealth creators with regulations that uh, are anti-growth. Um, I can only speak from a very, and it's going to sound very small town perspective, but actually I believe that small town perspectives can be extrapolated into uh, large communities. And uh, I'll you know, give you an example of what we did at plan in planning and environment when I was uh, minister in Jersey until recently. Uh, we looked through everything that one needed to make an application for and cut most of those that were unessential out. So for example, was it necessary to make planning applications for a garden shed or to build a conservatory? My view was it wasn't, so we cut it out. And I think that you can do that throughout virtually every sector in Jersey. And I'm sure there are lessons to be learned in the wider world. Okay. And if we take the final question there, please. Thank you. Uh, ben Adams from Staffordshire. Just to offer a bit of uh, reassurance and positivity to the room, uh, we were delighted recently to invite and uh, welcome Jaguar Land Rover to Staffordshire, 750 jobs. So just to put that in perspective, that was an international competition which looked at 100 sites, real pressure to beat India to be that site. And the thing that made the big difference was the County Council investing £20 million pounds in infrastructure. They needed a motorway junction, they needed it fast. We now have to build it in two years, and the highways agencies are telling us it takes four years. We've got a chance. The key thing for us in local government is sentence. Adam Smith is a real advocate of natural law. There's nothing more natural than incentive. Let us keep those business rates. Give us some clarity on that as soon as possible, please, <coughs> and we'll do a lot more. Let's take uh, closing remarks. We'll go along the panel, and we'll start with Alistair and finish with David. Um, Basically, I've just reiterated some of the things I've said, which is I think the economy is slowing. I think in part that's due to the Eurozone crisis, partly to domestic problems. I think the biggest domestic problem, or the biggest domestic drag, isn't actually spending cuts. It's inflation, which is very high and eroding take-home pay and slashing savings and savings incomes. So that's depressing demand. Um, so you've got that, you've got that slowdown. And I think the government has to not 
uh, give up on its austerity package, but possibly just refine the, the composition of it. But not give up on this austerity package, but be braver and more aggressive when it comes to improving the competitiveness of the UK and deregulating the economy and getting rid of taxes that are useless and hampering growth. From a, from a Jersey perspective, again, um, I would say that uh, we want to grow the Jersey economy in a way that contributes to the wider British economy and to ensure that all the business areas that we identify benefit Jersey and the wider British economy uh, without exception. David, if you could perhaps touch on the specific point about business rates as well. Well, what I would say is, first of all, in the, in the general, it is, it is very clear that the government deficit reduction plan is not the source of lower growth in the United States, France, Germany, the rest of the Eurozone, uh, or indeed the United Kingdom. And indeed, by having lower interest rates, which we have as a consequence of a credible fiscal plan, that is good for the UK economy. But the challenge about how we have a dynamic, competitive economy is a strong one. Uh, clearly, the news from Jaguar Land Rover is, 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 is very pleasing. Uh, but I am struck by the point, Ben, that you, you made about the international competition. And I remember uh, spending some time in opposition with Rolls Royce, and they went through some of the decisions, some of the reasons why they decided to locate a plant in Singapore. And the ability for Singapore to respond quickly, to provide businesses with what they need, to provide the infrastructure where necessary, the planning consent, uh, all of that was hugely impressive and that demonstrates what we're up against. So we do have to be uh, competitive on, 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 on whether it be on business rates, there's arguments about uh, localising that more, uh, whether it's about the tax burden overall, whether it's uh, regulations, we do have to be competitive. But the challenge for the government, but actually more widely, for the British people is how competitive are we prepared to be? How how strongly do we desire growth? Are we prepared to give up perhaps some of those uh, regulations that feel as if we're sort of protecting ourselves when in fact they're hampering our potential for the future? And uh, this government is making the argument, and George Osborne was making the argument this morning, that we do have to uh, be bold uh, and, uh, and ensure that we have the type of growth that we need in the UK by being competitive, and that means pursuing the supply side policies that this government is advocating, and I'm sure the Adam Smith Institute will be advocating we should be going further, and that's quite right too. So I think the argument to answer the, the question of the debate is, do we desire growth? Yes. Are we prepared to take steps to deliver it? Yes. Uh, and we're determined to make the case to the British people as to what is necessary. Uh, when and, and, and what strikes me about this <coughs> is that this is an argument that's with, here within the Conservative Party, amongst Conservative backbenchers, amongst Conservative-minded uh, columnists <coughs> and journalists, uh, what strikes me is that we're not hearing that debate from anywhere else, which is slightly worrying because we need a consensus for growth in this country. We don't have it at the moment. Well, thank you to all our panel. I'm afraid we're out of time now.